In the thrilling aftermath of Starship Flight 4's success, SpaceX is speeding ahead with groundbreaking preparations for Flight 5. Installation of the new and improved thermal protection system tiles on Starship 30 is continuing inside the high bay. In addition to addressing tile durability, SpaceX is focusing on reinforcing the flap areas and sealing hinge gaps to prevent flap destruction during extreme re-entry conditions. They have also replaced a Raptor vacuum engine on the ship, requiring a static fire test before the launch. The test will be performed on the new test stand at the Massey's test site. Super Heavy Booster 12, which will propel Ship 30 into space, is currently inside the Mega Bay undergoing preparations for Flight 5. Having completed its cryogenic proof testing, this booster will soon perform a full 33-engine static fire test on the launch mount, paving the way for a wet dress rehearsal and the anticipated Flight 5 liftoff, targeted for late July as per Elon Musk's timeline. A recent FCC filing for Starlink satellite communication during Flight 5 suggests a potential launch date as early as July 19. NASA's reservation of July 21 to 28 for its WB-57 aircraft, used to monitor and capture imagery of Starship launches, further supports a late July launch, unless there are any unforeseen delays. The FCC filing also indicates that the first stage booster will either return to the launch site or perform a controlled water landing during Flight 5. This means that if the booster fails to target the tower or encounters issues that prevent a tower catch, SpaceX will redirect it for an ocean landing. Musk previously mentioned that there is a 50% chance of a successful booster catch during Flight 5. At Starbase, teams continue to repair, fix, and upgrade the launch mount and other launch pad infrastructures to prepare them for Flight 5. The launch tower arms underwent minor repairs and fixes over the past two weeks to ensure that the arms remain in optimal condition for stacking the launch vehicles and also for booster catch attempts. A booster catch practice test was conducted on Wednesday, June 26, to ensure the success and reliability of recovering the Flight 5 booster for potential reuse. The test utilized a specialized booster test tank, designated B14.1. Standing 11 rings tall, B14.1 is the tallest Starship test tank ever built by SpaceX. It comprises a booster forward dome, a four-ring barrel, and a booster common dome. The forward dome features an older booster design with four methane pressure vents, chopstick lift points, and grid fin structural simulators. The middle section consists of a four-ring barrel with 74 internal stringers, similar to the booster methane tank. The aft section, a booster common dome piece, retains an older design with autogenous pressurization nubs and five liquid oxygen pressure vents. It also has a curved filled rain pipe installed. On May 30, the test tank was transported to Massey's for structural testing on the Can Crusher test rig. This rig, equipped with hydraulic rams connected to 20 cables, is designed to squeeze the test tank down to simulate the maximum forces predicted during flight. This ensures the booster structural components can withstand the stresses of an actual flight. SpaceX further conducted structural tests on the tank's lift points using attached pistons. The lift points, critical for lifting the booster onto the launch mount, are the very components of the booster that will interact with the tower arms during a catch attempt. They bear all the loads and the weight of the booster upon landing. The structural tests replicate the stresses these components endure during a booster catch, ensuring they can withstand the dynamic forces and pressures involved. After completing the tests, B-14.1 departed Massey's on June 21 and moved to the launch site. There, it was carefully positioned atop the launch mount with the assistance of a crane. Following placement, a hose was connected to the filled rain pipe, indicating that the tank was likely pressurized to simulate the structural rigidity of a fully fueled booster in flight. The catch practice tests began on Wednesday morning, focusing on the mechanics and precision of the chopsticks. The chopsticks were first closed and brought near the test tank secured on the launch mount, setting the stage for the catch simulation. Each tower arm features a rail equipped with dampeners to absorb impact forces during the catch. Initially, the left arm's rail was raised, initiating the testing phase. The arm was then maneuvered inward, making a controlled impact with the test tank. This sequence was repeated twice more, with each cycle lasting about 3 to 5 seconds from the start of arm movement to impact. Previous trials revealed that the tower arms struggled to halt without excessive swinging, due to their significant inertia, especially when moving at high speeds. By conducting controlled impacts, engineers can fine-tune the arm's movements and enhance the precision of the catch. These impact tests also provide valuable data on how the arm's force affects the booster's structure during a rapid approach and capture in mid-air. After the three impact tests, the left arm was fully opened, allowing the engineering teams to conduct a detailed inspection for any potential damage or wear.
After completing the inspection and ensuring all systems were in optimal condition, five more tests were conducted. This time, the left arm was opened wider compared to the previous tests, resulting in stronger impacts. The speed of the arm and the impact locations varied in each test, allowing engineers to determine the optimal speed and impact point that would minimize arm bounce and reduce potential damage to both the booster and the arm itself. After concluding the tests, teams inspected the test tank for any signs of damage or wear. Lab Padre footage revealed impact marks at the points of contact, but showed no major structural damage, indicating the tests were successful. Round 2 of the catch practice tests commenced the next day morning. Five impact tests were conducted on Thursday morning, which were faster and stronger compared to those on Wednesday. Following these impact tests, the teams transitioned to a different kind of test. This time, the landing rail on the left arm was deployed and the arm was moved slowly to the catch point. The arm was then pressed against the catch point, simulating the compressive stresses the arm and rail will experience during a booster catch. As the dampeners compressed, the rail lowered gradually. This test effectively simulated how the rail and dampeners will function when a booster lands on the tower arms. Both the arm and rail, along with the catch point, appeared to be in good condition after the test. A few more similar compression tests were conducted after the initial test with varying speeds and hold time. Overall, the arm impact tests and the landing rail compression tests appear to be a complete success, and the data collected will help SpaceX assess the performance of the left arm, landing rail and its two dampeners, as well as aid in calibrating the sensors and instruments on the arm. The recent tests focused solely on the left arm, likely because SpaceX needed to test the newly upgraded actuator installed in April. Similar tests may be conducted with the right arm after its actuator is upgraded. Future tests might also include simulations where both arms close together to mimic a full booster catch scenario. The construction of the second Starship launch pad and tower is advancing swiftly at the launch site. The tower base wall construction was completed a week ago, involving the installation of steel structures above the foundation. Subsequently, concrete filling began to reinforce the structure. Mounting brackets have also been installed on the base structure, onto which the tower sections will be stacked. Teams were spotted working on the seven launch tower sections stored at the Sanchez site the past week, performing the final round of work before their transfer to the launch site for stacking. The final two tower sections, the launch tower arms and the arms carriage, are yet to arrive at the port of Brownsville after departing from Kennedy Space Center on the 6th. The barge carrying the components was expected to arrive on the 23rd. The delay was likely caused by Tropical Storm Alberto, which caused a significant weather event for South Texas regions and the Gulf of Mexico. The barge is now expected to arrive on the 28th. The components it's carrying will then be transported to Starbase after offloading. The assembly of the Demag CC-8801 crane, crucial for stacking the tower sections, has been completed. The crane now has the height required for stacking the initial sections of the tower. The decommissioning of the old tank farm, paused for Flight 4 launch preparations, has resumed. According to an FAA document, Tower 2 is expected to be completed by August 15. Following this, the crane will be reconfigured into a smaller boom setup for other site projects. One of the three remaining oxygen storage tanks was removed from the tank farm and scrapped on the 25th. Now, only two vertical storage tanks remain, and they will soon be decommissioned. This will create space for the installation of additional pumps and heat exchangers, aimed at enhancing propellant loading efficiency for future launches. Blue Origin has officially filed a public comment with the FAA, requesting a cap on the number of Starship launches from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The FAA is currently preparing an environmental impact statement to evaluate the environmental risks of granting SpaceX a license to launch Starship from Pad 39A. This filing is part of the public comments on the draft environmental impact statement released two weeks ago. Blue Origin's concerns include the potential impact of Starship launches on the local environment, public health and safety, transportation, infrastructure, utilities, and airspace and maritime resources. They propose measures such as capping the launch rate, creating additional launch infrastructure to distribute the impact, and reviewing environmental testing conducted at the Starbase launch site. Similar concerns were also raised by the United Launch Alliance in their public comment. In response, Elon Musk accused Blue Origin of attempting to hinder SpaceX's progress through legal tactics, rather than fair competition. Elon Musk, in a recent interview with Tim Dodd the Everyday Astronaut, provided insights into SpaceX's ambitious plans for the Starship rocket program. We'll delve into the main highlights covered in this two-part interview. In the first part of the interview, Musk detailed several technological advancements critical to Starship's development. 
These include increasing the full stack of Starship height from its current 120 meters to potentially 140 meters or more, improving engine performance, reducing the propellant required for landing, and optimizing the heat shield for efficient reusability. The goal is to ultimately enable Starship to deliver over 200 tons to orbit with full reusability. In addressing specific challenges, Musk emphasized the heat shield is a primary concern that remains unsolved. SpaceX is actively innovating with new generation tiles, now twice as strong as previous versions, incorporating a layer of silicon felt ablative material underneath. These new tiles are the ones currently being installed on Ship 30. Regarding propulsion systems, Musk detailed advancements with Raptor V3 engines, highlighting their innovative design features. Unlike previous iterations, Raptor V3 eliminates the need for external heat shields, integrates secondary circuits and integral cooling mechanisms, and reduces reliance on bolted and welded joints, thereby streamlining manufacturing and maintenance processes. Musk highlighted plans to operationalize the Star Factory within three months, targeting the production of up to 100 Starships annually and potentially scaling to a thousand. He envisions a future where Starship could potentially launch every couple of hours. Highlighting operational dynamics, Musk emphasized the orbital logistics of Starship missions, noting the necessity for ships to align their ground track over the landing site, which could result in return times varying from several hours to half a day. To optimize launch frequency, Musk stressed the importance of maintaining a higher number of ships compared to boosters, ideally aiming for approximately five ships per booster. In part two of the interview, Musk discussed enhancements for Starship's next-generation infrastructure, highlighting the construction of a taller second launch tower to accommodate the next generation of Starships. The new tower will feature redesigned, shorter, and faster moving arms to handle different landing velocities more effectively and avoid the excessive swinging seen in the larger arms of Tower 1 when it comes to a stop. Additionally, the orbital launch mount at Pad 2 will also undergo a total redesign to include a more effective flame trench to mitigate risks and improve the reliability of launches. Musk provided detailed insights into the flap system on the Starship, which is crucial for its atmospheric re-entry and landing. He explained that at high speeds, the airflow is stable, allowing the flaps to make minimal adjustments. However, as the vehicle slows and enters the lower atmosphere, the control dynamics change significantly. The rear flaps are the primary control surfaces for maintaining pitch and countering the center of mass during descent. The forward flaps mainly control roll rather than significantly affecting pitch. Musk said that during the flight 4 re-entry phase, the right forward flap faced issues due to tile gap variances but managed to maintain control despite being stressed. Improvements in this area will focus on tightening tolerances and enhancing the robustness of the tiles and their alignment to prevent such issues in future flights. Musk also detailed plans to redesign the forward flaps and shift them leeward and further forward to improve the moment arm and enhance control during re-entry. Apart from these key points, a lot more details have been discussed in the Everyday Astronaut interview. The links to the interview videos are provided in the description. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a groundbreaking achievement, China's Chang'e 6 lunar probe successfully returned to Earth on Tuesday, June 25, carrying the world's first samples collected from the far side of the moon. The precious cargo, consisting of approximately 2 kilograms of rock and soil, landed in Inner Mongolia after a complex journey spanning over 53 days. The Chang'e 6 mission commenced with its launch aboard a Long March 5 rocket from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on May 3. After a week-long journey, the probe reached lunar orbit and autonomously touched down in the Apollo Basin on the far side of the moon on June 1. Using a robotic arm and drill, the lander collected 2 kilograms of lunar samples from the ancient impact crater, which is estimated to be around 2.4 billion years old. On June 3, the ascent module carrying these samples lifted off from the lunar surface and rendezvoused with the orbiter module, which was circling the moon. Upon docking, the samples were transferred from the ascent vehicle to the Earth re-entry capsule within the orbiter. Subsequently, the orbiter detached from the ascent vehicle and, on June 21, initiated its return journey to Earth. On June 25, the re-entry capsule, containing the valuable lunar samples, separated from the orbiter and entered the Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of approximately 120 kilometers, traveling at a velocity of 11.2 kilometers per second. As the capsule descended through the atmosphere, a series of parachutes deployed to slow its descent. The capsule then landed smoothly at its predetermined destination, with recovery personnel arriving shortly after in helicopters and ground vehicles. Following the successful recovery, the sample container was processed on site and subsequently airlifted to Beijing. Chang'e 6 is the first successful lunar far side sample return mission.
The samples are expected to provide researchers with a wealth of information that can shed light on the moon's history and evolution and help answer some vexing questions about the solar system's early history. Please check out my previous videos to learn about the Chang'e 6 mission in detail, links are in the description. China successfully launched the Space Variable Objects Monitor, a powerful space science satellite co-developed by China and France, into orbit on Saturday, June 22, from the Zichang Satellite Launch Center. The launch was declared successful by the Chinese Space Agency a short time after liftoff. Operating from a 625-kilometer low-Earth orbit, the 930-kilogram satellite, which took nearly 20 years to develop, will significantly contribute to studying gamma-ray bursts, some of the most violent and mysterious phenomena in the universe. Gamma-ray bursts are extremely bright flashes of gamma rays that occur when massive stars explode or neutron stars collide. They are the most luminous events in the universe after the Big Bang, releasing as much energy in a few seconds as the sun does in billions of years. SPOM is designed to detect and study these cosmic events with four state-of-the-art instruments, two developed by China and two by France. These instruments will detect and capture the gamma-ray bursts, measure their spectra, and observe the visible light emitted immediately after a burst. By examining the properties of gamma-ray bursts, SPOM will help scientists gain a better understanding of the universe's evolution, the formation of black holes, and the origins of heavy elements like gold and silver. While SPOM has a designed lifespan of five years, scientists expect it could remain operational for up to 20 years. The launch on Saturday was marred by an incident of rocket debris falling over a populated area in southwest China. Reports indicated that shortly after the successful liftoff of the Long March 2C rocket that carried the SPOM satellite, debris from the rocket's first stage came crashing down in the Gizhou province. Dramatic videos on social media showed panicked residents fleeing as the toxic debris fell in their village. The debris likely contained highly toxic and carcinogenic hypergolic propellants used in the Long March rocket. This is not the first time China has faced issues with falling rocket debris impacting populated areas. Its inland launch sites often result in boosters and other stages landing over villages after stage separation. Although Chinese authorities typically issue warnings and evacuation notices before launches, the recent incident has raised fresh concerns about the safety and environmental impact of China's space program. The Indian Space Research Organization successfully conducted the third and final test in its reusable launch vehicle landing experiment series, marking a major milestone in the development of India's reusable rocket technology. The first RLV LEX mission took place on April 2 last year. In that initial test, an unmanned wing prototype vehicle named Pushpak was carried by an Indian Air Force helicopter to an altitude of 4.5 kilometers and released mid-air at a distance of 4.6 kilometers from the runway. The vehicle then autonomously performed approach and landing maneuvers, achieving a precise touchdown on the runway. The mission aimed to simulate the exact conditions of a space entry vehicle's landing, including high-speed, autonomous operation, and precise landing from the same return path. Building on the success of the first mission, ISRO conducted the second RLV LEX mission in March to further test the autonomous landing capabilities of the reusable vehicle under more challenging conditions. The third and final test in the RLV LEX series, designated RLV LEX 03, was successfully carried out on June 23. For this mission, the vehicle was released at the same altitude of 4.5 kilometers, but at a shorter lateral distance of 500 meters from the runway. It performed complex cross-range correction maneuvers and achieved a precise horizontal landing at over 320 kilometers per hour. The mission validated advanced guidance algorithms and multi-sensor fusion systems, crucial for future orbital re-entry experiments. The successful completion of the RLV LEX series marks the end of ISRO's initial technology demonstration phase for reusable launch vehicles. The space agency is now gearing up for the next major milestones, the orbital return flight experiment and scramjet propulsion experiment. The orbital return flight experiment will see a larger 1.6 times scale up of the Pushpak vehicle launched on a GSLV Mark II rocket, performing a full atmospheric re-entry and runway landing. The scramjet propulsion experiment will test India's indigenous scramjet engine technology, crucial for future reusable launch systems. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.